All right. Uh, I think we'll get going. We just uh, we hit triple digits on attendees, so I think that's uh, probably a good opportunity to uh, to get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, also, good afternoon and good evening uh, for those joining us from uh, other parts of the world. But uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Lefebvre. I am a business development executive here on the Canadian team at uh, MBSI Wave. And uh, I will also welcome uh, all of our colleagues, customers, partners joining us uh, from the U.S. from our uh, WAVE family. Uh, to be honest, we do, like I mentioned, have representation uh, in the audience uh, from all over the world. And I thank you know everyone for uh, taking the time to join us. Uh, joining me today is uh, Louis Lambert, who is Chief Revenue Officer at Six Harmonics. Uh, I've known Louis for many years now, and I'm thrilled uh, that he is bringing his knowledge and experience in the market uh, to us all here today to uh, take a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, UHF broadband, uh, which is more commonly uh, known as uh, TV white space. We've got somewhat of a, uh, what I would call a, a summary of the topics that we had questions on. Uh, so we'll, you know, we're gonna treat this as somewhat of a loose agenda, but uh, ultimately the goal over the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour here is to cover off many of these topics as, as possible. Um, you know, on a daily basis, you know, we continue to see demand you know, for connect for connectivity. You know, it's part of our lives. Our industry is absolutely filled with uh, a number of great manufacturers, uh, all of which have uh, great solutions, each with their own you know uniqueness to the market and uh, the applications they serve. And uh, no difference here, um, as you can see. You know, from our our audience mix, uh, some of the pre questions that we had come in. You know, from our service provider and operator uh, customers globally. Uh, we had common requests for rural coverage growth, uh, distance, throughput, uh, particularly on network designing, and um, still have people uh, answering the question. But um, you know, hopefully, we'll we'll, uh, we'll have the time to cover all of these <laughs> from the industrial market. Uh, our system integrator, our partners, uh, we see you know many requests that came in for rural coverage, distance. Um, applications related to SCADA, industrial IoT, and we absolutely did receive uh, a number of requests, a number of questions on how TV white space and UHF broadband correlates with uh, the 900 megahertz space and, um, you know, some of the options related to the deep install base that 900 megahertz has uh, globally. And uh, we'll be covering some of that material during the webinar. Mm -hmm. And then finally, from uh, the government perspective, city officials, state officials, you know, we did see a number of requests around uh, community-based private networks. It's uh, a very interesting use case study using TV white space for that. And then other, uh, other aspects such as regulatory compliance, uh, spectrum funding. So these types of use cases do exist today and uh, Louis will be uh, touching on them as, uh, as we move through. But, you know, of course, it doesn't have to stop there. As, uh, as we move through the session, if, uh, if anyone does have any questions or want uh, something that they would like um, uh, answered, feel free to use the, uh, the chat window at the bottom of your screen and um, type your question in there. Uh, we'll sort of be collecting them as we go along and we've got some time set aside at the end uh, to, uh, to answer them. And in addition to that, you know, we want to make sure that, um, you know, people are paying attention. And uh, as we mentioned, when we started promoting this webinar, um, there's going to be an opportunity towards the end uh, for one of our audience members to win a uh, $100 Amazon gift card, which I guess is just in time for Christmas. Uh, the TV white space uh, UHF bands, you know, they've been around the market for many years. And I think it's safe to say that, um, you know, there's been a number of manufacturers that uh, have taken a crack at this space. And uh, we recognize, you know, that there are apprehensions around these types of solutions. But uh, ultimately, the goal here today is to dispel some of these myths and educate the audience on some of the exciting possibilities uh, with the technology. Uh, Louis, uh, you know, this might be a good time for you to step in. You know, sure. A uh, bit of history on the space and uh, how Six Harmonics is, uh, is, is viewing this market. So thank you, Louis. I'll let uh, you go from here. Yeah. Thank you very much. 
Everybody, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not going to go through the same introduction as Paul did, but thank you for MBSI. You guys are a great partner. They're a strategic partner of ours and a great good bunch of people. Um, and again, all of you folks that have decided to put some time aside um, to find out how we can help you with robust UHF broadband connectivity. So um, we're going to cover the topics that uh, Paul mentioned. And we have also uh, let one slide to give you a teaser of some of the other things that we do besides TV white space. So every presentation needs to have a disclaimer. We are going to be talking about uh, looking forward um, in, you know, with product availability and all of this. So um, everything is based on our best estimate as today, right? So it, it's an important, just in case there's some lawyers in the room. Um, so six harmonics and TV white space then and now. So I think um, Paul said it really well. There was originally some app apprehension. TV white space and the database of TV white space was precursor to CBRS. And um, they certainly did not have the marketing engine that Microsoft and, and the rest of the world had with CBRS. So people used to be scared of database. People now are embracing database. Regulators used to be scared of them. And regulators around the world are embracing that. In, in a way to monetize their spectrum, but for us end users and manufacturers, it's an opportunity to make sure this spectrum doesn't get too convoluted and unusable. And a main topic of today on, on, on the agenda. So six harmonics come from the, uh, from the uh, TV white space and, and we're continuing to evolve our TV white space. Our mission, um, and our, our vision is basically to try to make it simple. We want to make it simple for people to deploy critical service at the edge, whatever it's a digital divide service, or it's a remote PLC, or it's a hauler or something, right? We also, from a, from a mission perspective, we're building hardware and software. Um, and we are trying to enable people to be able to do real-time decision-making or real-time education or real-time surgery, right? So it's really important for us that if we make it simple, more people adopt it and they deploy it. Paul, if you could switch. So um, the company um, is, uh, well, I've, I've, I've covered some of this, but a couple of important points here. Um, in about, at the end of 2021, um, the, uh, board of directors and the investors um, made some change, brought a new CEO, the new CEO brought a new team and re-energized the company with one more money, more people, a uh, different group of people. And um, in the first six months, we basically established what is it we wanna do with this company besides TV white space and how do we wanna grow TV white space? So the result of what you're seeing today was initiated at the end of 2021. And there was an awful lot of work done and it went from seven people to 25 people. And the result is uh, what you're about to see. You can go to the next slide, Paul. Um, so just to give you a perspective as to why TV white space is important or, or UHF broadband, there is a, an awful lot of money spent outside of the industrial space, just in digital divide. This is just digital divide. And they can't do it all with fiber and 5.8 and you know, CBRS. There's always going to be an area um, that in digital divide they can't do with the high volume bands. They're going to be able, they're going to have to go to UHF. And there's not that many choice in UHF. This is the choice. You want to move to the next one, please? So this is not only for the digital divide. The early days of TV white space was only for digital divide. But what has happened is uh, the industri industrial markets, you know, oil and gas, mining, water, wastewater, they're all trying to do what some call SCADA 2.0, right? Or IoT or, you know, IoT uh, or IIoT industry 4.0. The fact is they want people and device to be connected all over the place. And this all over the place is not always in reach of 5.8. So as an example, uh, you can look at uh, a number of places around the world where we've helped, you know, in, in the digital divide, 
one of our most recent announcements was Pick Two County in Nova Scotia. Um, they're going to have 600 TV white space remote device out there. They're all six harmonics. And the reason why they have to do this is that it would have cost them way too much to put towers to reach everybody with 58. So the cost of the radio was a lot less uh, uh, expensive than building more towers. In the industrial space, we, uh, we made public that Shell was using us offshore because you know they were connecting vessel with 5.8, but as they get past the 5.8 range, they were losing completely. With, with our equipment, they tripled the range of 5.8. You can go to the next one, uh, Paul. So, so we'll talk about distance and, and throughput, but let me maybe switch to the next slide and just show you a bit of a visual. We're gonna show you a few visual slides um, where we're talking about one kilometer, one mile to 30 kilometer, you know, 18, 20 miles. Uh, it's not a technology that will give you gigabit per second um, at one mile, but it's a technology that will give you more meg megabit per second than any other technology at the other end. And it's not just because we have great radios, it's also the band. The band is really allowing us to do a lot more than, than just a little bit of communication in the, in the best of time. We, uh, we do have the same non-line of sight as 900. As a matter of fact, we have better non-line of sight. We're lower on the spectrum. And the cost of ownership is comparable to 900 because it's all about the towers, right? You want to go to the next slide, Paul? So um, we do have a bit of a global audience, but even if we were talking to specifically Canada and US people, I would still like to show this slide because the ecosystem benefits from a global distribution power. Manufacturers cannot lower their price if they don't have volume and you cannot have volume if you don't have access to the globe. So this slide is very important for you to understand, even if you're a US or Canadian uh, person in the audience, the rest of the world help you lower the price. So I just wanted to give you an idea of which countries in around the world uh, is doing this TV white space now. And I can tell you that when I started in TV white space 20 years ago or 15 years ago at Redline, there was two countries. So you wanna to go to the next slide, Paul? So we're gonna spend a minute uh, or a minute or two on this. Oh, I think you went, went too fast. Oh, too so, quick. Yeah. Fast mouse. Yes. So um, let me explain to you um, this, um, what I was trying to convey with this. On the vertical axis, yeah, you've got the location on the tower where you would put equipment. Um, on the horizontal axis, you basically have range or distance, right? So in the, the size of the marker use is in the thickness of the line is the megabit per second that that band can actually deliver regardless of the manufacturer, right? So, so we're seeing a huge amount of um, movement in five gig and six gig and even still in 2.4 because they have wider channel and they can reach people at a real good reasonable range with big capacity. UHF does not have big channel. So if you don't have big channel, you can't have big capacity, but UHF gets you that channel much further down the road. And there's two noticeable UHF band around the world. The 900 ISM or the 900 private, we're gonna talk about the ISM one now, and the TV white space band. They have very similar properties. The only difference is there are gazillions of people using 900 ISM. And I can tell you with confidence, because we're close to the database managers, there are less than 500 TV white space device installed in North America. The band is completely available. And I just mentioned early on that PIC2 was gonna deploy 600. That account alone will double the amount of TV white space device installed. So it's a gold rush. Anybody that is having problem with 900 megahertz today and still wants to be in, T in, in UHF, 
should seriously look at this. Go to the next slide, Paul. So if you are a 900 megahertz customer today and you have an ISM 900, you're not getting the throughput you wanted to get. You're not getting the distance you wanted to get because you're fighting interference. You have, you have a couple of choice, right? Um, do I go up spectrum, like on the previous slide, and then you lose range, so you need to build more towers? Um, or do I say, stay in UHF? And if I stay in UHF, what are my choices? And the real choice is really broadband UHF, and there's no real other choice. So go to the next slide, please, Paul. So this slide <laughs> helps paint the picture differently. Uh, on the left side, you have 700 megahertz TV white space, you have 600 megahertz, you have 900 megahertz, and they're all small towers and tiny little antennas at the remote end at 20 miles away, right? And then if you go in 2.4, 5.8, 6 gig, big towers, big money, lots of them. And at the remote end, often if there's trees, you have to be above the trees. So the infrastructure cost of 900 ISM was the driver for the success because the infrastructure cost is far less, right? So if you're a 900 <clears throat> megahertz user today in the ISM band and it's unusable or, or not reliable anymore, the logical choice is to stay in UHF so you don't need to start to be in the tower building business. And the tower building business is the total cost of ownership. The, the equipment price is irrelevant almost when you start looking at <clears throat> doubling, tripling the number of towers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next slide. I think, uh, yeah, no, I, I just, uh, I'm going to just jump in here real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I just, uh, I'm not going to circle back to the previous slide, but I think you were making a, uh, an interesting point and analogy. And you know, from our perspective as MBSI Wave and Wave, you know, we've got uh, a number of different relationships with a number of different manufacturers, like I mentioned earlier, um, all with their own sort of, you know, unique uh, product line and, you know, view of the market. And, you know, you touched on it, you know, as you go up uh, in frequency range, you know, you're typically um, blessed with extremely wide channels. And that's where we see, you know, a lot of solutions in, um, dense areas, community-based networks, you know, using, you know, gigabit style radios for uh, coverage. And then, like you mentioned, as you get into, you know, a little bit longer distances, you're getting into two, four and five, eight. And uh, I think you're making a, a great point here of, you know, extremely rural areas or private network scenarios um, using uh, UHF as, uh, as an option to that. And I guess, you know, where I'm trying to frame this a little bit is in the turn in the in the actual use of the spectrum, I think it's in, you know, it's an important aspect that we're actually using a model that's I'd call it shared spectrum or something that's, you know, regulated by, you know, some type of government uh entity, uh, whether it being ISAT or the FCC or other type of global uh organizations. And, you know, I look at that in the, you know, the license, uh -huh. it's not licensed spectrum, but it's a, it's a controlled spectrum. And uh, for one, one aspect and one way to look at it is it, it kind of creates an asset-based solution for the operator, for the end user, where, you know, they're not only deploying a technology, but they're deploying it in a spectrum range that to some degree is regulated. And it, it sort of de-risks, you know, that aspect of it to some degree. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I wanted to just, you know, add that. And uh, I know, you know, the next section of this is um, sort of getting into that spectrum database management, but um, not sure if, um, you know, you have any comments on that. Yeah. And somebody asked a question while, <clears throat> while we were talking to elaborate on the amount of channel. So there's 228 megahertz of spectrum pretty much in every country for this TV white space. The TV, the UHF TV channel in most countries around the world are six megahertz wide. There's a few exceptions where it's eight, but most of the world is six, and that's the worst case. So if you take 228 and you divide by six, you have an idea of how many channels are available out there. And the number of UHF TV broadcaster, 
has not increased with digital TV, it's, it's reduced. So there's even more channel available now than they were last year. And there's definitely a whole lot more than they were, you know, a decade ago. So there's a ton of channel. I would say that they are where we need them to be. Um, you don't need a lot of channel in New York City because you have fiber in New York City, right? But you and you don't need a, a lot of TV white space available channel in New York City. But if you go in, in for the Canadians here, anything, the whole population is pretty much 100 miles north of the border. You go 300 miles north of the border or 200 miles, there's not even broadcasting, not, not a whole lot. So there's a, an awful lot of channel available. Same with New York, with the, the states. If you get out of the major city and if you get out of these suburban environment, I don't, I, the rule of thumb is if the 4G coverage is not really good, it's a great place for TV white space. So that's a real quick analogy. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> I think we're ready to go to the next one. So uh, we want to talk about a bit of design in uh, how do you approach these, which is in line with that how much spectrum is there. So we got these like six steps that we like to use, right? So step number one is uh, we basically, um, when we're having a conversation with somebody that is inquiring, we want to know where they are. So AP, GPS coordinate, AGL, and we, we have the capability to see how many channels are available at that specific location. So that's the first qualifier, right? How much channel is available? Can you get a good business out of this? If you're an oil company, is it, can you connect your PLCs and your well pads, right? So how many channels? The second step is we'll do a small RF prediction of what could be done with these channel from your tower, your existing tower. If you want to build new one, that's one thing, but we're trying to make sure that people don't, don't have to build new one. The third step is we'll give you a rough order of magnitude of, you know, how much work is going to be to do that and how much money is it going to be. Um, then if you like this, people order the equipment. And one of the things that we do that, that has not been done in TV white space before, or in a lot of broadband companies don't do it, is that we will preset the equipment and set the database. And the next slide will go a bit more in detail. So I'll talk about it on the next slide. And lastly, but not least, we want the six harmonics customers to not have to worry about the database. So let's go to the next slide because I'm going to cover the database item. So earlier this week, um, we made an announcement. Announcement don't come just at the spur of the moment. Here's the rational behind that announcement. In order for us to be successful in driving the price down, we need volume. In order to get volume, we need just... We need more than Canada and US. We need to go globally with TV white space. And you saw that there's a lot of countries around the world that allow it. So we're trying to remove all the little speed bumps um, and difficulties. And one of them is some countries don't have a database. Some countries do, and they don't, and they don't know how to operate it. And a lot of times the database supplier is if you don't pay your bill, they shut you down, right? So here's what we announced. We decide to work with uh, RED. We work with all database, but we have a specific relationship with them where we're going to wholesale their database. <clears throat> and we're going to work with them and include the database in the entire process. So you buy a network from us. If it's in within the RED database area, the radios are pre-arranged, pre-configured, and we pay the fee. And you don't need to worry, all oh, my accounting person need to make sure they don't forget to pay for the database management fee, right? Because if the FCC, if you buy license from the FCC for licensed microwave, you pay it once a year, you pay it three years ahead if you want, you don't forget it. And you have somebody to do that. But in this shared spectrum world, you may not have anybody dedicated to do that. And, and what if somebody forgets to pay the bill? So we take care of all of it. We also, we are committed to work with them and implement our solution with their database in additional countries, raising the volume, dropping the price. Go to the next slide. So we're working with a database. We're trying to make it simpler and we're trying to do a bunch of stuff. 
but we also need to do another thing. We need to improve the technology. And in order to make it better, we are releasing today. We were not planning to release today. We were planning to do that in January. But when we saw many people were signed up, we decided to let the cat out of the bag today. So we're announcing today the introduction of our 5,500 radio. Uh, the 5,000 was the current radio. It was fifth generation. So, so this is fifth generation with um, an, a, a series of improvements. Uh, this 5500 radio is going through certification right now for Industry Canada, um, FCC, and Etsy, which is most of the European country and most of the African country. Um, so uh, go to the next slide, if you, if you uh, can. So what have we done to this radio? And um, in order to go after the 900 market, in order to go after more than wireless ISPs, and in order to satisfy the industrial customers that are trying to exit 900 and looking for a place to go. So we've made more capacity at longer range. So at whatever you're at, 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer, 30 or five, 10, 20 miles, you will be able to get more capacity at that range than you were able to go to do before. We've created a separate ethernet port in order for our industrial customers to be able to have a dedicated management port. Sometimes even WISPs will have a third party maintenance company that needs to be able to get access to the radio and you don't want them to be coming in on the same port as the payload traffic. So the, the radios have two ports. One is dedicated for today into network management. There's nothing preventing us later to have a second ethernet feed to it because we're, we're going to be approaching maximum Ethernet speed. Uh, new mechanical uh, rapid se sector reselection, uh, although we're not officially allowed to use mobility in the TV white space band, what we can do is fast nomadicity. And so we've deployed that offshore, onshore, and it's a, it's a new addition to the software. We've improved the GPS re uh, reception. Um, we've improved security with, um, we have a, we had ADS security before, but AES was a bit taxing on the throughput. Now there's a, we have AES without tax. Um, and um, from a physical security, the second port obviously is a huge physical security. And the other thing that we're doing with the software is that we used to have different loads of software for different countries. So if you're an oil and gas company and you use us in Asia Pacific and you wanna use us in Africa, you might have two different loads. So with the 5,500, uh, our global customers can deploy this anywhere. And it's always the same load of software. They all get upgraded at the same time. It's easier for their management. Go to the next uh, slide, please. So it's a bit more of a plug and play solution than it ever was. It's actually a lot more plug and play. The bottom image there is a CPE with a little stubby antenna. Um, of course, you can unscrew it and put a regular GPS antenna with like a three foot cable. But from a CPE perspective, the stubby makes it much easier. It's a cleaner installation. It'll fit somewhere where the other ones would be more complicated. There's new mechanical. The CPE is completely new. The mechanical is completely new. The base station has been modified quite a bit. Uh, we've put a handle on the base station. That was at the request of the riggers right? So they can hoist it up the tower. Um, we made it simple enough that we have WISP um, that are using students to install CPEs. They don't know anything about wireless. They only need to teach them how to do weatherproofing and proper grounding. That's all they need to teach them. Um, in the industrial space, we've got um, oil and gas customers that are using their electrical, their on-site electrical contractor to do the installation because it's simple. Now, if um, if some of you on the phone are reseller or VARs that are catering to the oil and gas industry, that would be you because if you're certified to go on their location, they would be using you. So we made it simpler for you and it, it's, it's much safer as well. Um, so this we've done better mechanical, better throughput, Balance link budget, so MIMO, two by two MIMO both sides, so it's a balance link budget. 
it comes, the CP will come connectorized or with a 30 centimeter, 12 inch flat panel or a 60 centimeter, two feet flat panel. So we've done all these things. So what's next? Well, if we really want to motivate people, the next thing is how much does it cost? So go to the next slide. So we're happy to report that we have broken the $500 mark. That has been a problem in TV white space. That has been a big problem. Uh, it's one thing to have a $500 cost. It's another thing to be able to sell it at $500. So we're launching this 5,500 that will become available in February with all the certification and also compatible with all the, the database around the world that are doing CB, uh, TV white space right now. Um, and what we're doing is um, we're basically subsidizing the CP. So I'm, I'm being completely transparent with everybody because some of you guys on the phone are actually my old oil and gas friends. And I got a bunch of people here that, that have registered. So what we're doing is because the channel size is so small in TV white space, you would not deploy like 50 of them on a sector like you could do in 5.8 or in 6 gig. The channel size are too small. If you divide, you know, these small channel size into 20, 30 people, um, they won't get anything. Our average customers have between three and six CP globally. And it's driven because of the size of the channel. So what we're doing is buy a sector at the $69.95, and we'll let you buy up to 10 CP at $500. You're probably not going to install 10 but you may want to buy a couple of spares if on your first kit. And the reason why I'm saying you're probably not going to install 10 is just because, again, the small channel. Even if you can bond four channel and you have four channel available, that's 24 megahertz. You're going to get about, you know, 60, 70 megabit per second. If you're in that area and you can get four channel, you're probably going to have a better return on investment as an operator to sell a 25.5 or a 40.10 service than selling small service. So you'd better, better, you get a better ROI and a lower total cost of ownership if you keep your CPE count down. That's why we limit it to 10. And if you're an oil and gas or a, or a SCADA operator, um, you no longer want SCADA 1.0, you want SCADA 2.0, you want cameras, some of them PTZs. So you're going to want five mega at every site anyway. So that's the deal right now. If you call your MBSI person and you say, I was on a webinar, I want to get some of these 5,500, they won't have all the order code today because we rushed the introduction. We were supposed to do that in a month, but next week they'll have all the information. They'll be able to respond to your question. And we also be able to book some appointment with any one of you guys. If you want a one-on-one -on -one, cause you're not feeling comfortable disclosing some of your questions with a bigger audience. So that's the that's the TV white space thing. But I want to spend a minute to talk yeah. about something else that we're doing. Unless you have a question, uh, I was you. just uh, I was just going to jump in real quick again, Louis. Appreciate that. Um, I guess uh, and it actually came in on the chat, and we've had uh, a handful of questions so far. I'm going to save a few of them uh, for the end. And again, to everyone on the call, if you have any questions, throw them in there. But um, looking at, uh, I guess, your existing install base, existing customers, um, previous uh, models, like the 5,000 as an example, yeah. um, from a upgrade path compatibility standpoint for the existing install base, do does the 5,500, is it backwards compatible? That's or a very good question. And you know what? This should have been a bullet on the slide. We, I take this stuff for granted. Of course, right? So if you've deployed 5,000 base station and 5,000 CP, because that's what we were selling up until today, we still we still have some, but I don't think people are going to want them anymore. Um, so you can have a 5,000 CPE talking to a 5,500 base station, but more importantly, you can put a 5,500 CP to a, an older 5,000 base station. The 5000 was a receiver diversity CP. It did not have two by two by more, but the base station did. So if you put a new CPE on an older installation, 
you will get the benefit of 2 by 2 MIMO on that link. If you were a point-to-point -point customer, you could replace, let's say one 5,000 get hit by lightning, you can replace a 5,000 with a 5,500. It's 100% compatible. As a matter of fact, with this new release of software, all the 5,000 and 5,500 will run the same software. And the purpose for that is to make it simple for our global customers. Great, appreciate that. That was a great question. Uh, just a, and a quick follow up, and it's really uh, tied to the point on the slide. And I think it's um, it's an important message to hammer home on uh, the red database fees. So you're showing one hundred and twenty dollars yeah. here, and so, I guess is that yeah, old model versus what you're covering, or just a little bit of clarity on that? Yeah. So so uh, red communicated with so there's been some movement in the database, red Phoenix and CSIR. There's some movement in the world on database. Um, most of these people are also going after CBRS because it's a great market. Um, so the, the bigger one, they go after CBRS as well, and they are getting even bigger. Uh, so Red announced uh, that starting in January, rather than be $30, $40 per base station and nothing for the CPE, it'll be $10. And I'm speaking for the Canadian, uh, the U.S. market. It'll be 10 and 10 10 for the base station, 10 for the CPE. And in, in Canada, I think it'll be more like 15, right? Because of the exchange rate. Uh, the fact is that uh, people are paying a whole lot more than that for CBRS. Uh, and they're happily paying for it because it protects them from interference problem, right? You get what you pay for. If you go completely unlicensed in 900, you basically hope when you go to bed that in the next morning when you wake up the interference has not gone so bad that your network is down this is the price to pay it's not license spectrum it's lightly licensed and yes there is a fee but with that fee um comes the benefit so I, i'll tell you what a lot of the wisps are doing a lot of the wisps are charging the database fee as part of their fee they're telling the customer if you want to live downtown New York City, I don't need to worry about this. I got fiber, I got this, I got that, right? But if you, Mr. Customer, decide to go live 200 miles from the nearest town and you're having some difficulty, I have to use different equipment to service you. So for the last decade or so, many service providers have been charging the database fee to their customer. Just pass it through and saying, I have to use the spectrum to service you. I would encourage for you guys to think about this. The customers won't mind paying. They made the choice to go live really far. And that's only in countries where there's database. The countries that have no database, well, you have less security um, from, a, from an interference perspective, but it's still an underutilized spectrum. Does that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And I guess just to just to hammer it home based on, you know, the, the recent press release, um, you know, anyone that's looking to deploy a six harmonics TV white space solution, you guys are including that fee. Yeah, we got your back. We got your back. Not okay. only we're paying for it, but we're making sure it's getting paid and you don't get a letter saying we haven't received your payment, uh, you know, 60 days from now we'll disconnect you because that's their right, right? So we take care of it. But more importantly, I think is we are, we want to expand that globally. So so we we ship more units and we get higher volume and we can lower the price. Right. So um let's go to the next slide for one minute because I, I do wanna I don't want to distract too much from TV white space and and UHF broadband, but uh, Six Harmonics will never become a $100 million company or $200 million company if we only do UHF broadband. And that's been one of the problems in TV white space. The manufacturers have struggled because the volume was not there and it was difficult for them to grow the business and lower the price. One way to do it is to increase the volume, partner with Red and go global. That's one way, that's a real good way to do it. Another way for us to, the, to have growth in our company is to go develop an additional market that is ad adjacent, right? So um, the, the unit in the blue in the middle is our 
X next generation product. Um, it's more than just a TV white space. We are going to have a new TV white space eventually, but we're developing an edge compute. So it's again, IP67, three interface cards. So most people would put 4G or 5G, Wi-Fi, maybe TV white space, or maybe LoRa. Uh, and then it's got under the hood, a lot of uh, ARM-based computing. So the wireless ISP that are looking at providing more value at the edge of the network, TV, phone, security, alarm, rather than have a kludge box, they can put all of their bolt-on services on this platform and still have a TV white space board coming out or a 4G or a 5G, or let's say LoRa, if it's something like sensors for an industry. Our oil and gas customers are gonna be looking at this and say, hey, I can run a remote PLC, a virtualized PLC. I can run virtualized camera server. I can run all of this on an LTE network, 4G network, and I can even have a LoRa gateway at the very end. So we're developing this technology and we're developing the software piece to orchestrate all these Docker container software that we're gonna be hosting that are not gonna come from us. And, and the idea here is to again, have an easy button for our customer. So what does it have to do with TV white space? One of the board can be a TV white space. And for the WISP on the phone, um, that would be your edge compute platform that you can bolt on the outside of the house. You don't even need to ask people to put it inside. So if you ever have to service it, you don't even need to get in the house and you can have a Wi-Fi AP go right through the house, right? So it's a new category of device. It just doesn't exist today. We're the first one coming out with this and it's at the request of our oil and gas mining, uh, water, wastewater, WISP customers. So that was a teaser for what's coming from Six Harmonics. Well, the market, uh, the market's definitely trending and asking for edge computing, edge devices. You know, we see it every day. You see the trends towards it. So it's it's encouraging to hear that you guys are uh, adopting that and, um, you know, running with that technology curve on it. Yeah, I think, you know, um, because we have a mixed bag on the phone, the WISP are looking for, looking for stickiness and bolt-on service and the industrial operators are looking to, to reduce the number of box. And they don't want to have to put a stainless steel cabinet at every location. Imagine putting a, we can attach this to a D10 bulldozer for mining and they don't need to have the realist, they don't need to put a cabinet to house a bunch of little computers. Everything is into one, right? So it's, uh, it's the future folks. I mean, people, pipes are us, it's not good enough. You need to do more than pipes. Um, so I guess in closing from my part, you know, we have a very simple approach. We like to meet with the customers, understand what they're looking for, understand their challenge, see how we can solve them. Um, we have a great commercial partner in MBSI for some of the geographies. Um, it's all about what solution can I bring to you so we can be different from anybody else. Uh, and it's also about support and maintenance and have a live person responding when you have a problem. And the support and maintenance is what drove us to bundle it, the database so we're fully responsible for the unit working or not working. So thank you very much. That was my last slide. I'll give it back to you, uh, Paul. Thank you, Louis. Great job. All right. Um, so now we're going to uh, we're going to kind of get ready to uh, to close this out. Um, we did receive a number of questions, so we'll get to those uh, in about uh, thirty seconds here. But uh, as I mentioned, and as we promoted, we do have uh, a prize to give away, and uh, the format that we typically follow with this is uh, I'm going to provide a question here verbally, and the uh, the first correct answer in the chat window. Uh, we'll win that gift card. And uh, it's as simple as that. So get ready for your keyboard. Yeah, get ready for your keyboard in uh, three, two, one. Yeah, no. Um, so, you know, with uh, the release of the, the GWS 5500 in early uh, 2024, effectively now, um, if you choose to deploy that solution, whether in an operator network or um, an industrial type application, uh, we're looking for the answer of what should you expect to pay for the cost to register that equipment into the database. 
how much will you be looking to pay? Well, we got lots of answers. Wow. Oh, we got a winner. And the answer is no charge. No charge. And the you first. Know, Ron Verd, you're not allowed to bid on this. <laughs> Seamus, I think that's. Uh... Seamus, you're not allowed. You're an employee. <laughs> Well, uh, you're going to have to go back in time, but there was a few people that got it right. Okay. Seamus is an employee? Yeah, he, count, he doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Uh, okay. Ingo Aprakuma, you are the first one here that answered correctly at $0. So we appreciate that, uh, Ingo. Uh, you'll be hearing from uh, one of our team members on the marketing side uh, following this. Uh, to make arrangements uh, to get you that, um, whether it's U.S., Canadian, you know, we'll figure it out. But we appreciate everybody's responses on that. We got quite a few. And uh, what we'll do now is we'll just move to the last slide here. And uh, Louis, we do have a handful of questions. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, so first is, um, I guess, on bandwidth and the relation of CP sector to 10 CPEs. Um, if a you know if an operator or a customer was to deploy a, a one to ten ratio, you know what uh, what would they typically expect to see on a bandwidth perspective? <clears throat> and going one layer deeper, um, if someone wanted to do like a hundred megabit, twenty five megabit service, um, is that possible in this? Okay, so let's talk with let's go for the easy one first. Um, it's five. It's roughly five bits per hertz of payload traffic, right? So let's say you're not 100% at the highest modulation. Let's assume it's four, right? On average at five bits per hertz. And if you get, you can only, the government only allows us to bond four channels. So that's 24 meg of full spectrum. Um, so we cannot reach with this technology, hundred megabit guarantee even if you're fairly close. It's not designed, that question is probably driven by a beads um, requirement. This is not a beads 120 technology and it's not because the technology cannot do it, it's just a spectrum, this so little spectrum, the channels are narrow. However, there's other fundings in the States that are 25.5 that can certainly do that, right? There's a lot of technology to do 120, and they're usually shorter range. Um, the 25.5 uh, funding in the States and in Canada, um, this technology does it in a heartbeat. Awesome. So now the second part of the question, um, what can you actually get, right? So let's do worst case and then you quadruple for best case. Let's do worst case, you only have one channel, right? Uh, you got, you've got a lot of sectors that you want to install. There's four channel available in your area or eight channel. And you decide that you want a lot of clusters. So you're using only a six meg channel. In a six meg channel, you can deliver a, a, a good amount of bandwidth. Um, one of our employees, not Shamus, but one of the other one lives in California. He's paying seven, $69 a month. And he's getting a five meg down, one meg up, $69 a month in California, not in Africa, not in the developing market. And he's, <clears throat> he's paying a pretty penny, $69 a month. That technology could do this in a heartbeat. The customer, that the service provider in that area, they're using 5.8. If they were using TV white space, they could probably double and triple the capacity because they're at the far edge of the 5.8. So with a single channel, we, we, risk, we can guarantee a 15 meg down, you know, five meg up. With two channel, you can do twice that. With three channel, you can do three times. And four channel, you can do four times. So I like to tell people the reality of life is a 60 meg down link and, you know, something like 15, 20 up link is what we realistically can commit to and with a straight face. There's a, and that's payload traffic, not to be confused with some other companies advertising hundred megabit per second, but it's, it's not payload traffic. 
you don't make money on TCP. You make money on, you know, the real payload. So it's it's not because the technology is not available in the world. It's just because they're narrow channels. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, perfect. And uh, the same person that actually asked uh, that question had uh, just, I guess, confirmation. Is the system multidirectional or is it point to point? So I guess the answer is both. Yeah, so <laughs> another good bullet, right? Because they... We were going to do only 900 and we decided to do a whole lot more. So the radios are a software defined and you have to t tell the radio, are you a CPE or a sector? The sector can only be a sector or a master or a slave from a point to point. The CPE can only be a CPE, but from a software perspective, does it, is it a, the edge of a point to point or is it the edge of a multi-point? it's it's all software definable so you only keep one set of spares you don't need to keep different spares great great answer and what would uh on the round trip latency what uh what kind of uh, yeah are you so saying? again we uh i come from from uh, a father that was a cop and kept on telling me the truth is painful at first but it's always the best so we can do sub five milliseconds latency, but um, these are good conditions. The The reality of life is that not all of your CPEs are gonna be at the highest modulation. They're not all gonna be next to the base station. So the latency goes up a little bit as you go further. And I think that what we see out there on average is our customers are going anywhere between sub five to 20, 25 milliseconds latency throughout their network. And it really depends on how taxed the base station is and how far the remotes are and, and how far they all are. So which I'll open a caveat on this. If you have a 5.8 network and you've got 20% of your remote that are at QPSK, lowest modulation, these remotes are dragging the performance down of your base station because your base station spends a lot of time talking at low speed to these faraway device. This is where the mechanics of TV white space or UHF broadband come into play. If you were to remove these faraway device from your 5.8 system, your 5.8 system would go up and you'd be able to sell more capacity and you replace these faraway location with TV white space, which were designed for that. You'll get a better overall throughput for all your customers and you can charge more because you'll be able to sell up capacity. Good In the point. industrial space is the same. If you're trying to put a, a, a PTZ camera on an oil pad that is 10 miles from the CPE, from the base station, you, you're gonna tax that base station so much that everybody's gonna suffer. Remove the outliers from 5.8, put them on UHF and everybody wins. Great. Uh, on the topic of channel bonding, can you bond four channels in Canada? Yes. Canada allows, Canada, US, and uh, a few other countries allow up to four channel bonding. Um, we actually were on the phone with I said yesterday because uh, we're trying to make the rules a little bit more flexible. Um, but yes, you can bond four channels. We have customers doing that. As a matter of fact, if you go 250, 300 miles north of the border, there's lots of channels. Excellent. Do you ever see a situation with um, the government's allowing, I don't know if the government's allowing, is I don't know if that's the right word for this, but uh, can you see the radio hardware using wider channel widths with bonding, like maybe 32, 48 megahertz with a software upgrade? Um, could it be done with software? Yes, uh, because it's not hardware related, right? Because um, it's, it's how many carriers you want to put on. The challenge is not, can you put six or eight? The channel is that the challenge is that the regulators are demanding that they are um, adjacent channel. So finding adjacent channel in quantities becomes harder. Now, there are some discussion with the regulators that we could do non-adjacent channel, uh, but then they're going to want the filters, the RF filters to be so tight that the price of the equipment would have to go up. So... I don't know if that's a good idea. They have lots of good ideas. FCC and I said, they have lots of good ideas on to make the band even more attractive, but most of their ideas 
means that I would have to double the cost of my radio, and that's not attractive to anyone. Makes sense. All right, we're getting uh, we're getting close to our time here, but I've got three more questions. Um, I just want to cover quickly. Um, I know we had that spectrum chart that showed all the different options. We had a little discussion around that. How do you see in uh, some of the rural areas the application of satellite or Leo and how that plays with TV white space? Would you look at it as competitive, or is there a complementary element there? Well. Um... I'll use the word coopetition, right? So um, if you're a wireless ISP trying to service rich cottagers around a big lake um, and uh, there's not a whole lot of trees, but they're really far, satellites are a good solution, right? Um, if you're, uh, we were at a conference in Kelowna not too long ago and a guy was saying, oh, I've got lots of cottagers. They got lots of money. They don't care but their trees are so big that they can't get satellite. They have to mount them on the roof of the cottage or on the top of a pine tree. So satellite does, you know, we have a tool, it serves a great purpose. It's a hammer, it's not a drill, right? The other guys have a drill, they don't have a hammer. I think they coexist. And I think that I look at, you know, like Elon's Starlink as a great way to get back all in the middle of nowhere rather than use licensed microwave with 15 hops, right? So it's a great way to get back off. It's not necessarily the best way to connect every residence all yeah. the time. So we see ourselves being used as a multi-point distribution or fan out, hub and spoke type technology. And in the middle of the, the wheel is a satellite uplink. Okay. We see a lot very, of that. Very similar question, but... Um not satellite, but moving towards a very sensitive topic in Canada is the migration from 365 to, you know, 800 to 3,900 spectrum availability. Yeah. yeah. You see uh, UHF applying against that space. Yeah. So, so us people on the phone, please don't laugh. We may even hear you. Um, but the Canadian regulator in some infinite wisdom has decided not to make 365 available like CBRS and they're taking the band back and only the MNOs were able to bid on it. So what does that leave the WISP with and the industrial customers like oil and gas and mining is they have to relocate themselves eventually. So um, there's a number of options. Um, I would go back to the statement I made earlier on if you use a mix of 5.8 and the TV white space, you'll cover more than what you get with 3.6.5. So whenever it's really close, and if there if 5.8 is usable, use it. If 5.8 is not usable, you can use UHF. The problem is the channels are smaller than what you've been used to, right? So I would say it's a combination. You may even want to save towers and say, I'm going to radiate using UHF from the towers where I had 365, and I'm going to put 5.8, but I'm going to limit the amount of 5.8 because of interference. I'll use 5.8 if I have to, and I'll use TV white space to, to go cover everybody. Great. All right, uh, two more questions, Louis. Um, first one is, uh, I'll, I'll phrase this the way I know how. What's... Uh, What's your comfort level on distance of a link and what's uh, what's your record right now in some of the deployments you've seen? What's a realistic number to to leave the audience with on how far you should push these? 100 kilometer, everybody likes to say this. It's achievable. You have to be between two mountain tops and it's not going to happen very often. And it's not the most reliable, right? You know, uh, it would be surprising to most of you guys that we have a lot of customers that are we're one kilometer. It's pine trees, there's lots of them, it's a campground, they can't cover with 5.8, with 2.4, with nothing works, and we do it. So that's the extreme on one end, like small range. Um, on the opposite end of the, spe of the spectrum, no pun intended, we've got oil and gas company using us offshore, right you know, 20 feet above the ocean, which is very difficult to do, and doing 30 kilometers. That's real, that's uh, reliable, right? So, but the average customers um, is between three and seven CPE and the bandwidth 
um, when they cannot bond channel. The bandwidth is usually 10, 15 megabit per second. When they can start bonding, and most of them bond too, then they're getting a 25.5 service, really reliable at 20 kilometers. Very good. Very good. All right, we're going to leave you one last question, and it's more of a, a summary again uh, on everything related to the database management and the cost. Um, I know that uh, you guys are going to you have worked something out with Red, but uh, I think we had someone join late. Can you just uh, reiterate one more time if what someone would under normal conditions expect to uh, what the cost would be uh, to register with the database and what you guys are doing? um to offset that so we'll, for I'll leave you with that and that'll be it for you yeah so for any anybody that is using six harmonics um in canada us where red operates we will uh, we will manage operate and pay for the fee um if you were not a six harmonics customer you would pay in the states ten dollars per month per device, CP or base station. And in Canada, I think it will be $15. Um, and what you get with that is you get uh, the assurance that people know you're using the band and, and they won't be encouraged to go there. So they'll choose a different channel. <clears throat> and also it protects the incumbent and the incumbent won't complain about you. So there's a real big advantage to use the database. Uh, and it's mandatory in Canada, U.S., and we take it. We will take it. Perfect. All right, thanks, Louis. Uh, we've gone a few minutes over here, so we're uh, we're going to give everybody back uh, their time. We understand uh, very valuable, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, we appreciate uh, everyone taking the time today uh, to attend this. Uh, this webinar was recorded, and um, if uh, you want to forward it on, view it again. You'll find it posted very shortly on our social media pages. Uh, this question slide here had a few um, uh, key codes that you could have clicked that would have brought you directly to uh, each of the individual websites of the organizations. But uh, we all have active social media accounts, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, I encourage everybody uh, on the call to follow us, like us, um, you know, have a look at our websites. You know, obviously we're here to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, obviously encourage uh, everybody in the call to get in touch with your WAVE or MBSI WAVE account manager. Uh, if you require any additional information, uh, both organizations have a great team of uh, engineers in place so we can help with any pre-sales, post-sales support. Uh, obviously in the RF world that we live and breathe in, uh, network design, network planning, is a sensitive topic, an important topic. Uh, we want to ensure that uh, our team is looped in with uh, the Six Harmonics team to make sure that any deployments that you might be looking at um, get designed properly. And to your satisfaction. Yeah, absolutely. We are here to uh, to help. Uh, as always, uh, this is uh, one of many webinars that uh, we typically run. You know, we do have others planned in the future. Uh, we'll be sure to keep everyone posted on those. And uh, I'm just going to close by saying uh, once again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Louis, great job. Thank you uh, for taking the Thank time. you for hosting us. Always it's a, a pleasure. pleasure. Always a yeah, pleasure. It's a pleasure. And thank yeah. you to everybody to putting some time on your calendar to listen to uh, another way to uh, solve problems. Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be safe.